Good afternoon and welcome to another lecture in our series, Reasons for Hope. As always, I want to welcome members of the faculty, staff, and students of CU, but extend a particularly warm welcome to anybody who's coming in from outside and joining the CU community for this lecture. I welcome our friends and colleagues from other academic institutions across the city, and I welcome uh, distinguished members of the um, diplomatic community. Um, we run an ongoing seminar for ambassadors and senior members of delegations across Budapest, and we're always delighted to see our uh, diplomatic colleagues. Um, let me just say also that, that um, you're here, um, your presence is a testimony to the impact that Chantal Mouffe has had on our thinking about democracy, um, populism, um, and political theory more generally. She's the Emeritus Professor of Political Theory at the Center for the Study of Democracy at the University of Westminster in London, and she is currently spending a year at what could be called, without too much exaggeration, our sister institution, the, the IWM in Vienna. And um, so we welcome her from uh, Vienna and we welcome her from London. She's also a corresponding member of the Collège International de Philosophie in Paris. And we associate her thinking and her work with two concepts that have been enormously influential in our thinking about democracy. One is the idea of agonistic democracy, which I will leave Professor Mouf to expound, but has influenced me in its emphasis on the fact that what we're seeking is not a democracy based on consensus, but in fact, the very purpose of democracy is to encourage and create the space for pluralistic, fundamental, agonistic debate. Um, the second idea that we associate commonly with her work is the idea of left populism. Um, populism is commonly used as a kind of scare word um, Chantal Mouffe is asking us to think much more seriously about the possibility that there are varieties of populism to the left, to the right, and we need to distinguish clearly between types and forms of populism, depending on their commitment to democracy, depending on their commitment to human rights, depending on their commitment to certain values. It depends very much how you define this word, and her contribution to this has been extremely important. She is the author of Dimensions of Radical Democracy, Pluralism, Citizenship, Community from 1992. She's the author of The Democratic Paradox. She's um, uh, written uh, a book in, in the name of the people on Podemos. And she's just recently put, up, put out a book called For a Left Populism, published in 2019 by Verso. We're delighted to have her here. She's going to speak about affect, emotion, passion in politics, and the mastery and organization of those emotions. And I, on your behalf, want to welcome Chantal Mouffe to see you. Thank you very much, Michael Ignatia, for this um, invitation um, to give a lecture in this Reason for Hope. And I hope to be able to bring you some hope, uh, not uh, absolutely secure, but at least show that there is, there is possibility for hope. But the, the future is not so dark, so absolutely dark as it might seem at some, some point. Um, when we examine the present state of democracy, 
One of the assertions that we often come across is that our current condition is one of post-democracy. The meaning conveyed by this notion of post-democracy is that modern democracy, while maintaining the facade of formal democratic principle, are increasingly controlled by privileged elites. By the way, this concept of post-democracy was is particularly associated with the work of Colin Crouch, which is a British political theorist, but Jacques Rancière also used it in different ways. Uh, but I think Colin Crouch is the one who, he wrote a book ab about that, so he's usually associated with it. And in, in fact, he's the one who insists precisely on this dimension that I've just mentioned. The implementation of neoliberal policies has led to the colonization of the state by corporate interests and public political decisions are now taken outside of the traditional democratic channels. This is at the origin of the loss of legitimacy of democratic institutions, which manifests itself in a growing phenomenon of abstention. You know, that's very classic of the situation in, in Western Europe. Well, in a book published in, 19, in 2005 on the political, I have examined the reason for what I call the post-political perspective, which has become dominant in liberal democratic societies. In fact, in a way, I think it's important to see that as the origin of post-democracy. Uh, I have argued that it is linked to the move toward the centers, which in the last decade has been the strategy of social democratic parties in Europe. A strategy that under the motto of the third way, was first elaborated uh, in Britain by New Labour. I mean, one of the theories was Anthony Giddens. Uh, and of course, this was put in practice by Tony Blair. According to this approach, Western societies have entered a second stage of modernity, one what they call of reflexive modernization. By the way, we find also something similar in the work of Ulrich Beck in, in Germany. Uh, it, from the, uh, certain time they were, uh, in fact, developing this theory together. So reflexive modernization, and the idea is that the adversarial model of politics, which is a characteristic, second, uh, according to um, Beck and Giddens, the uh, first stage of uh, um, simple modernization, this model has become obsolete. Giddens claimed that it is no necessary to beyond left and right. In fact, that's the title of one of his books. And we need to envisage a new politics. Uh, Beck wrote a book about new politics, what they call a radical center. That is, uh, which transcends the old-fashioned left-right divide. Well, such a view was later adopted by other socialists and social democratic parties which began to present themselves as center-left. Under the pretense of modernizing the social democratic project, because they say it needed to be adapted to a globalized world, center-left parties, in fact, if we could say, capitulated to neoliberalism. Convinced that there was no alternative to the current form of globalized financial capitalism, they have accepted the framework established by neoliberal hegemony. That was very clear with, in Britain with the case of Tony Blair, who, when he came to power, did not at all put into question the hegemony, neoliberal hegemony that had been established by Margaret Thatcher, but simply tried to, you know, in fact, do some kind of a more humane form. I remember the time I wrote an, an, uh, 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 an article called uh, Blairism, a Thatcher in with a human face. Uh, and in fact, that, of course, was very typical of uh, the famous uh, Third Way. Uh, having abandoned any attempt to exist, challenge the real existing relation of power, they limited themselves to propose way, as I was said, to humanize neoliberal globalization. And of course, this is why their politics, uh, their policies, sorry, were in fact very uh, difficult to uh, distinguish from the center. Uh, right uh, parties. You know, this is what I have called the consensus at the center, uh, rapprochement between center right and center left. Well, it seems to me that this, in the discussion about post democracy, the role played by this post political situation is not sufficiently taken into account. It is, of course, necessary to grasp the 
transformation of the capitalist system, which have provided the economic condition for the success of neoliberal globalization. But that does not automatically explain the reason for the disappearance of a vibrant democratic debate about the different ways in which social relations and public institutions can be organized. By failing to acknowledge that politics is intrinsically partisan, that's one of the main theses I've developed through my work, and that democratic politics requires a choice between real alternative. You know, when, when citizens go to vote, they need to uh, really a choice. And this is what I call an agonistic debate between conflicting projects. And this, of course, is what is, was eliminated by uh, the, this uh, consensus of the center. So this consensual politics of the third way, in fact, if contributed to the disaffection with politics, which is at the core of our present post-democratic situation. So I think it's important for me to see that it began, you know, uh, in the 80s with uh, uh, um, what was happening in, in, in Britain. When citizens feel that they cannot have a say in fundamental decisions which concern their common affairs, and that political questions are dealt with by experts because they are considered of a technical nature, Democratic institutions are emptied of their substance and their legitimacy is threatened. You know, this is clear movement. It's evident that if you accept that there is no alternative to neoliberal globalization, then it means that political decision, well, they are only uh, technical. There is no real choice that is at stake, you know, no alternative. So they are. Uh, technical decision, and if they are technical decision, it's better that it's expert who, who uh, solve them. And why should the citizen, you know, ever say that? And I think that that's something which has been extremely important as a consequence of, you know, the transformation of social democratic parties in what we can rather call social liberal parties, which are, of course is at the origin of the crisis of social democracy. Uh, because elections are reduced to providing a rubber stamp for measures imposed by a variety of actors whose interests are not publicly accountable. And we could say that the democratic process loses its raison d'être. I mean, this, of course, is one of the characteristics of pro-democracy. To be sure, our societies still claim to be democratic. But what's the meaning of democracy in our post-political times? Well, I think that you know, it's important to think a little bit about what democracy really means. And I've, I've scrutinized the nature of our Western democracy, liberal democracy, in a book which is called The Democratic Paradox. And there I brought to the fore the tension existing between the two ethical political principles of this liberal democracy. Here I insist when I speak of liberal, it's only in the sense of political liberalism, and nothing to do with, with uh, uh, economic liberalism. So those two ethical political principles are liberty and equality. Liberal democracy should be understood, in fact, as the articulation between two different traditions. You know, on one side, there is the liberal tradition of the rule of law, individual rights, separation of power, and on the other side, there is the democratic tradition of popular sovereignty. The uh, Canadian political theory, C.B. McPherson, has shown how, through this articulation between the liberal and the democratic tradition, which he say was established during the 19th century, uh, liberalism was democratized and democracy was liberalized. Uh, and this is, I think, the characteristic of our model of democracy, because we speak of democracy, in fact, there is a specific Western model, and part of my work is to precisely, and see that you know, there are other ways in which the democratic principle can be inscribed. So I, I, I've been arguing with Habermas for a long time about the idea that we should not universalize our model, saying this is the only way in which you know, democracy should be understood. This is the way which is, exists for us. It's our form of life, as with Ben Shen will say. And of course, we uh, will defend allegiance to this form of life, but we should not pretend that you know, in, in China, in, in uh, uh, Africa, in the Muslim world, you know, they should uh, apply that model. I don't think that democratization necessarily means westernization. Um, so what's important in this 
liberal democratic model is that there is in fact always a tension between the exigencies of liberty and those of equality. Some people, of course, there's a long discussion about that. Uh, Carl Schmitt, for instance, believes that there is a contradiction between liberalism and democracy. For him, liberalism negates democracy, democracy negates liberalism. On the other side, we've got Jürgen Habermas, who speaks of the co-originality between liberty and uh, democ- and, and, and equality. Well, in the democratic paradox, I take a different position. I say that there is certainly not a contradiction, but there is certainly no co-originality. There is a tension between uh, uh, the two. Uh, a tension which I think is, is, is productive. I don't, it's not something that we should try to eliminate because it is a tension which provides the dynamic of the confrontation between left and right. In fact, this is where the agonistic is it's in this tension that the agonistic uh, uh, debate can take place. And this is what guarantees pluralism. I think that the history of democratic politics in the Western world can be visualized in terms of the struggle for the predominance of one of these principles over the other. In some period, the liberal principle uh, was dominant. In other, it was the democratic one. But notice this was important. The contestation always remained open. That this tension always was at work. What has happened under the current hegemony of neoliberalism is that the liberal component has become so dominant that the democratic one is almost disappeared. Democracy is no understood simply in terms of rule of law and defense of human rights, but defense of human rights understood in a very you know, specific neoliberal uh, sense. And of course, the idea of popular sovereignty has been relinquished as being obsolete. You know? Often people say, popular sovereignty in time of globalization, what a much is, we should not, we can't speak about that anymore. I think that's something important to understand populism. Those who resist the rule of the elites and insist on the need to give a voice to the people to make room for their demands are being accused of being populist and presented as a, representing a danger for democracy. Well, in my view, the, this displacement of the democratic tradition by the liberal one is one of the main features of our post-democratic condition. And it is clearly visible in the abandon by center-left parties of the struggle for equality. You know, equality being with popular sovereignty, the other central element of the democratic tradition. Their main slogan are no about choice, fairness, equity, and inclusion. I mean, I remember the, Tony Blair, for instance, or the choice. I'm going to give you choice. You will be able to choose your school, your doctor, and that's what became, you know, the main uh, 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 motto in, in uh, uh, the third way: choice. But of course, they are at pains to avoid speaking of equality because they consider the notion of equality as being too tainted by the equalitarianism of the socialist ideal that they have repudiated. The price of the vocabulary that constituted the backbone of a left vision of society, it's not surprising, therefore, that the left has been unable to envisage an alternative to neoliberal globalization. And in fact, you know, the, the old crisis and uh, uh, pro- co- current uh, crisis, for instance, of uh, po- social democracy, I think is very much linked to, to to that, the fact that they, they, they don't really have uh, uh, the, the value that were central to them has been uh, uh, eviscerated. Well, this is to refer to a period which is changing. So this is why I think we can have a little bit of hope, but there is also danger. Because I think that after years of post-politic and unchallenged neoliberal hegemony, all this moment in which you know, the third way was the dominant, by the way, it's not completely disappeared because, for instance, uh, uh, Macron in, in, in France is, is uh, uh, reviving. That's, for me, the way we've been in, in Britain, the time Tony Blair is rather interesting to see that what is presented in France as a new politic with Macron is exactly you know, the application 30 years later in France of uh, um, the, the Blair, Blairism. In fact, uh, I, I wrote some time ago a tribune for Le Monde, where it was called uh, Macron, the state subli- uh, supreme of uh, 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 post politics. Uh, because, in fact, in the case of uh, um, Tony Blair, there was still 
Cent alternation, centerize, and telef. Macron wants to get rid completely of that. No more left, no more right, all in, in one party, which is La Republica March. No? Nothing very original about that. We've seen that in Britain 30 years ago. But uh, uh, so this is changing fundamentally because we are seeing now some kind of. I will even go to the point of saying that we are witnessing a crisis of neoliberal hegemony. Uh, and this is manifested by the emergence of political movement rejecting post democracy. And it's claimed that there is no alternative to neoliberal globalization. So my point here is that today we are in a different conjuncture than the one that I analyzed, for instance, in, on the political. And this is this conjuncture that I uh, uh, have tried to analyze in my more recent book, For a Left Populism. Because I think that this rejection of post-politics and post-democracy that we are seeing through the years of protest movement and new, uh, uh, is something that can, of course, bring the danger, obviously, but also some, some hope. And the rejection of post-politics and post-democracy manifests itself under the form of a drawing of a political frontier, something which is really a break with post-politics. Post-politics is that there is no political frontier. You know, no, no. Uh, that, that's a typical liberal idea. We, and, and, Tony Blair used to say, for instance, we are all middle class, no? so you know, what we should all agree. No, no political frontier. Well, this is changing because, in fact, no, we are seeing a series of movements who are drawing a frontier in a populist mode. That is, on the mode of the people versus the establishment. And this is why I propose to speak of a populist moment. Here I was, uh, want to make some, some uh, uh, little um, aside to say that it's interesting to uh, uh, see, compare our situation today to the one that uh, Karl Polanyi, uh, uh, here in fact speaking in Hungary, I'm, I'm really glad to refer to Polanyi, which I think is really one of very, very important uh, uh, political thinkers. Uh, in, in thanks God he is being rediscovered. Uh, well, he might not have, com he never completely disappeared, but I think it's important to know it's really re being recognized. Well, there is a lot of people talking, ah, oh, it's coming back of the, the, the 30s, but on, on a mode, you know, fascism. I, I think that there is some analogy with, with the 13th with, in the following way, because I think that uh, Polanyi, in the Great Transformation, analyzed what he called the double movement. And, and I, he say, for instance, that the, the movement that uh, uh, took place in the, in the 30s were, in fact, a movement of resistance against what had been the consequence of the, the marketization of society, what was the product of the first globalization. Uh, and so he showed how this movement, it was followed in the 30s by a double movement, a movement of reaction against that. The society began to defend itself against this aggression by the market. But, and this is what I think is very important, and it's similar to the, our situation, he also indicated that this reaction, this moment of pro, pro, uh, project, uh, protection, could take many different forms, and it took many different forms. It can be regressive or progressive. And for instance, regressive, because of course, this is, you know, it took the form of fascism and Nazism, but it also could uh, uh, be uh, something that were in the sense of reaffirmation of democracy, and that's the case of the New Deal of uh, uh, FDR, you know, uh, because what Roosevelt uh, did was precisely to take advantage of this situation in order to uh, the, the, make some redistributive measure and, and democratize society. So I think, that, and that's what, uh, uh, where I think that there is you know, both uh, hope and danger, we are in a situation which is analogous to the, what I call the populist moment is precisely a moment in which all those resistances against post-democracy you know, can lead to very different uh, uh, solutions, different issues according to the fact, is it going to be populism of the right or populism of the left, which is going to become uh, dominant. Uh, what is at stake in this populist moment is how the resistances to post-democracy are going to be articulated and how the, this you know, frontier, people, establishment, 
uh, uh, people elites is going to be constructed. Because there are indeed many ways in which that can be done. And it's clear that when I speak of the people, the people is a political category, political construction. The people is not the population. And I'm, a lot of people have got difficulties in understanding that. You know, the people is never the people. It's not an empirical reference, not a sociological category. It's a construction. And of course, it can be constructed in different ways. Uh, they are some construction of the political frontier, which can have egalitarian objective, but not all construction of political frontier have political uh, uh, egalitarian objective. Uh, even when the rejection of the existing system is made in the name of giving power back to the people. And that, of course, is very much the discourse of right-wing populism. We are going to give by the, the elites if you know, taken your voice, we are going to give you back. No, no, but even, even if it's the case, it can construct it in a way which is not you know, going to uh, um, develop democracy. Both type of populism aim to federate and satisfy demand. And they federate precisely uh, um, people wanting, you know, reacting against post politics, wanting to have a voice. But I think there is a motto of the indignados in Spain, which I think is very appropriate. They used to say, Tenemos voto, pero no tenemos voz. Tenemos, uh, we, we've got a vote, but we don't have a voice. And of course, if you go to vote uh, at the moment in which basically between left and right, uh, center, right, center, there's no grand, big difference. You, you have a vote, but you don't have a voice, you know? And I think that uh, this is the reaction against that. Uh, uh, um, demand, which can be federated in different ways. The difference lies in how the we, the people, is going to be constructed and how is the, the, its adversary, you know, the, the, the them, the elites, uh, is going, also going to be constructed. Right-wing populism claims that it will bring back popular sovereignty and restore democracy, but this sovereignty is understood as national sovereignty. And it's reserved for the people who are deemed to be the true nationals. Right-wing populism does not address the, the amount of equality. And they construct a people that exclude numerous categories, usually, of course, the immigrants, seen as a threat to the identity and the prosperity of the nation. It is, we could say, a form of politics of immunization, you know, against the, 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 the threat the, 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 that the, those other groups represent for our identity. Their victory could lead to nationalistic authoritarian form of illiberal democracy. In that, in the name of recovering uh, democracy, in fact, this movement drastically restricts democracy. This is, you know, the danger of writing populism. And obviously, the objective of a left populism would should be completely different. It's also a question of recovering democracy. You know, struggle against both democracy, but in order to deepen and to extend, to radicalize it. The Social Democratic parties, who in many countries have played an important role in the implementation of neoliberal policy, this is something that must be acknowledged, are not able to grasp the nature of the populist movement and to face the challenge that it represents. Of course, their uh, uh, traditional answer is to classify right-wing populists as extreme right, neo-fascists, uh, or they attribute their appeal to lack of education, uh, um, or you know, the fact that m m people move by negative passion, as they, they see. Uh, and this, of course, we must realize is very convenient for them uh, and for the center-left in, uh, center in general because it is an easy way to disqualify those movements without recognizing the center-left own responsibility in such an emergence. Because I think, and that's also an, an argument I'm making, that not, not exclusively, but there are many parts of you know, people, particularly the working class, who, and that is clearly the case in, 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 in France, but also in, in uh, um, uh, Austria, for example, who are voting for those right-wing populist parties because they've been abandoned by social democrats, you know, who, who they, they decided not, not to uh, address their demand anymore. 
So I think that you know this is something that the, those parties should they should make an autocritic. But of course, by presenting that oh, it's a return of the blonde, blonde plague, you know, some kind of a, a meteorological phenomenon. We don't we don't have anything to do. Is not we're not responsible. Of course, this of course you know is good. It's a position which is convenient because it does not. Uh, uh, um, it eliminates any responsibility from their part in this movement, but of course it does not help to understand the reason for those movements. Um, by establishing a, a some kind of moral frontier, so to exclude the extremists from the democratic debate, the good Democrats believe that they can stop the rise of what they see as irrational passion. I think that's such a strategy of demonization of the enemies of the bipartisan consensus can certainly be morally comforting, but it is totally politically disempowering because they cannot recognize that many of the demands articulated by right-wing populist parties are in fact or at the origin, they are democratic demands. In a sense, insisting here on the fact that as far as they are reaction against post-democracy, it's a demand for democracy. And the question is that the left need to give a progressive answer to those demands instead of leaving you know, right-wing populism to articulate them in a xenophobic way. To stop the rise of right-wing populist parties, we need, therefore, that's my argument, a left populist strategy able to design a properly political answer. And that answer should consist in the creation of a people, a collective will, a we, that federates all the democratic demand against post-democracy and try to federate them in a way that is going to lead to a radicalization of democracy. And of course, that uh, signifies that uh, you are going to construct a, a, a people whose adversary is the oligarchy. You know, I think that's important to realize the, 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 that that is a stake. And by understanding that, uh, um, and I could give you some example uh, uh, if you want in, in the discussion about the way it can be done. For instance, the case of La France and Soumise and Jean-Luc Mélenchon, they've managed to under, make people understand that their enemy are not the, 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 the uh, 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 immigrants, but they are the force of neoliberal globalization. This is what I mean to establish you know, a we and them being the oligarchy. But that, of course, requires to recognize the democratic nucleus, which is the origin of many of the demands, not all, of course, but many of the demands that right-wing populism expresses in a xenophobic vocabulary. And providing a different vocabulary, I am orienting those demands to a more egalitarian objective. Of course, I do not deny that there are people who feel completely at home you know, with right-wing populism, uh, uh, reactionary values. But I'm convinced that there are others who are attracted to those parties because they feel that they are the only ones that care about their problems. And I believe that if a different language was made available, many people might experience their situation in a different way. And you know, be recruited for the progressive struggle. Of course, we must be aware of the fact that the demand that the left populist strategy seeks to articulate are very heterogeneous. And this is what they need to be articulated in what uh, uh, we call in the book Hegemony and Socialist Strategy that uh, I wrote, Jean-Louis Bitternet, a chain of equivalence. You know, the way in which, in fact, in that book we were already published in 1985, arguing for the need to articulate the demand of the working class with the demand of the new movement. Because we felt that, that the problem that the traditional social democracy was not understanding the importance of feminism, anti-racism, and uh, already, you know, some uh, environmental issues. So that's what we call chain of equivalence, to try to articulate those demands, to find form of solidarity between different demands. This process of articulation is crucial because it is by their inscription in such a chain of equivalence that singular demand acquire their political signification. So it's not so much where those demands come from that count. Of course, it is it's important, but this is not really fundamental. It's 
what is fundamental is all the demands are articulated with other demands. As the example of high wing populism testify, for instance, demand from the uh, workers, <laughs> demand for democracy coming from popular classes, can be articulated in a xenophobic vocabulary. They do not automatically have a progressive character. It is only by entering in equivalence with other democratic demands, for instance, like those of the immigrants or the feminists, that those demands will acquire a radical democratic dimension. We should never take for granted that they are struggles that are inherently emancipatory and cannot be oriented toward opposite end. I think, for instance, that the current development of form of ecology with a clear anti-democratic characteristic should be seen as a warning that the refusal of the neoliberal model is not a guarantee of a democratic advance. With ecology as in other domains, the question of articulation is decisive. And this is why it is essential to establish a link between the variety of democratic demands around the identification with a project of radicalization of democracy. So the objective for left populist strategy should be the creation of a popular majority that is going to come to power. And of course, it's an electoral strategy. It's a, a strategy that takes place within the institution. It's not a revolutionary strategy of you know, putting an end to, to uh, uh, liberal democracy. And the aim is to establish a new hegemonic formation within the framework of liberal democracy, a new hegemonic formation that will provide the condition for a recovery and a radicalization of democracy. What's at stake is a construction of a people around a project which addresses the diverse form of subordination around issues concerning exploitation, domination, or discrimination. And this requires, of course, reasserting the importance of the social question, because we must accept that this is a question that has been recently left aside, uh, and, and for me, it's really also one of the reasons for the uh, uh, success of riding populism, taking of course account of the increasing fragmentation and diversity of the workers, but also of the specificity of other important democratic demands, for instance, about feminism, anti-racism, and those the LGBT community. A special emphasis must be given to the question that have gained particular relevance in the last 30 years, and which is of special urgency today the future of the planet. It is impossible to envisage a project for radicalization of democracy in which the ecological question is not at the center of the agenda. It is therefore essential to combine this with the social question. And this is why I'm so enthusiastic about projects like the Green New Deal uh, uh, that uh, Alexandre Ocasio-Cortez is, is you know, promoting in the, uh, the US and also, uh, for instance, uh, in Britain, the, the Labour Party and the Corbyn taken that very seriously. They speak a, green, a, 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 green, a new green industrial revolution. I think that's absolutely crucial, the articulation of the social with the ecological question. No doubt to abandon the productivist model and implement this pro project requires you know, what Gramsci will call an intellectual and moral reform. But I think that an ambitious and well-designed ecological project could offer an attractive vision of a future democratic uh, society that might entice some sectors which are currently within the neoliberal hegemonic group. group. Because, for instance, uh, often people say, ah, oh, but they are uh, the loser and the winner of neoliberal globalization. And, you know, it's, it's, you, you, you can't really put those people working together or, uh, around one project. Well, I think that uh, among the people who are, you know, profiting from neoliberal globalization and who are quite happy with that, well, those have children, they have got grandchildren, and I think they might become aware that you know, this model, in fact, is destroying the possibility of a future for those generations. So we can really, I think, on the basis of a really you know, well-designed uh, ecological uh, program, win those uh, people for a progressive uh, alternative. Here I want also to emphasize that the objective of a left populist strategy is not the establishment of a populist regime with a predefined program, but to bring about a new hegemonic formation that will foster the recovery and the deepening of democracy. 
This hegemonic formation will take different shape according to the specific trajectories involved. It could be envisaged, for instance, and this is the case of the strategy of uh, Jeremy Corbyn in Britain, which definitely is a left populist strategy. They speak of democratic socialism. Jean-Luc Mélenchon speak of eco-socialism. Some other people in, 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 in uh, um, Spain, they don't really think that uh, speaking of socialism is, is particularly attractive. Uh, for the new generation, so they will rather speak of uh, participatory democracy. So they are different, you know, it's not a regime that we are uh, going to implement. It's creating the condition for recuperation and radicalization of democracy. The chain of equivalence to which the people is going to be constructed will also depend on historical circumstances. And its dynamic cannot be determined in isolation from the contextual references. So. It's important to realize there is no blueprint for all this is going to take place, and there is no final destination. What's important, whatever the name, is the recognition that democracy is the hegemonic signifier around which the diverse struggles are articulated, and that the institution of political liberalism are not going to be discarded. Well, now, to finish, uh, uh, there is a question which I want really to emphasize because it, I think it's absolutely crucial to envisage this left populist strategy. Uh, is the decisive role played by affects in the constitution of political identities? I think that the lack of understanding of the affective dimension in the process of identification uh, is one of the main reasons for which the left, locked in a rationalist framework, is unable to grasp the dynamic of politics. Recognizing the central role played by affects in politics and how they can be mobilized is really decisive for designing a successful left populist strategy. Of course, here I'm, I can't develop this because you know, it would take another uh, uh, presentation, but I need to indicate that this question about the role of the affects, I'm posing it within the framework of an anti-essentialist ontology that we have developed in, uh, with Ernesto Laclau in hegemony socialist strategy. Crucial to this framework is the assertion of the discursive nature of the social and the thesis that they are no essential identities, but only form of identification. You know, what we call an identity is always the result of a product of an identification. What's at stake in politics is the construction of political identities, and that it always entails an affective dimension. This is crucial. And of course, this is what Freud called a libidinal investment. They're always in the construction of political identity, it's a libidinal investment. Freud, of course, is central for my reflection because besides asserting the general thesis that the social link is a libidinal link, he brought to the fore the crucial role played by the affective libidinal bonds in processes of collective identification. As he stated in his book, Group Psychology, and the analysis of the ego, and here I quote Freud, a group is clearly held together by a power of some kind, and to what power could this feat be better ascribed than to eros, which all together everything in the world, end of quote. For Freud, affects are the qualitative expression of the quantity of libidinal energy of the instinct. This libidinal energy is malleable, and it can be oriented in multiple directions. That is, it can produce different effects. I think that this point is really important to realize that different forms of politics can foster different affective libidinal attachment. And it also helps us to refute the essentialist view that adjudicate given affect to specific social agents. For instance, in, 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 in uh, France, there is a whole discussion uh, and it's linked to a book by Eric Fassin. We say we should not even speak with people who vote for Marine Le Pen because those people are moved by uh, uh, 
affects which make them necessarily intrinsically uh, sexist, uh, racist, homophobic. You know, so those people, they, 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 nothing to do with them. I mean, this is what uh, Macron called it's a leper. You know, well, I, I de uh, profoundly disagree disagree with, with that thesis because it's an essentialist thesis that people are moved. There. Some people are moved only by that kind of affects. I think that my affects are malleable. I mean, of course, the, the, and the discourse in which those affects are going to be inscribed is crucial. You see, so they can move to different uh, orientation. And here, I think that it's inter interesting to to call. Uh, um, Complement uh, Freud reflection with some insight by uh, Spinoza uh, conception of affects, and namely a distinction made, made by Spinoza between what he called affectio and affectus. Affectio being affection, in the fact of being affected, and affectus is affect. Like Freud, Spinoza believed that it is desire that move human beings to act, and he notes that what makes them act in one direction rather than in another are the affects. But of course, but it does not ascribe specific affect with two specific people. You see, it's the, the inscription is the, in, the, in which affection they are inscribed, which is going to promote some affects. An affection for Spinoza is a state of a body insofar as it is subject to the action of another body. When affected by something exterior, the conatus, and uh, the conatus for uh, Spinoza means a general striving to persevere in our being, and of course it's a crucial concept of Spinoza, the conatus will experience affect that will move it to desire something and act accordingly. I find this dynamic of affectio affectus very helpful to envisage the process of production of common affects. And I propose to employ this dynamic to examine the mode of construction of political identities, seeing affection as the space where the discursive and the affective are articulated in specific practices. You see, so in fact, it's, it's, again, again, it's against the essentialist thesis that people are moved by some affect. It depends in which uh, discursive, affective, uh, affection practices, they are going to be inscribed. This is what uh, 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 is going to lead them act in one way or, or the other, you know, in a xenophobic way or in, in, in a way which is, in fact, more, more towards radicalization of, de of democracy. Well, on the question of practice, because I think this idea of practice is very important, I think I also draw my uh, uh, inspiration from Wittgenstein, who taught us that it is by their inscription in what he called language game, and we call that uh, with Ernesto discursive practices, that social agents form belief and desire and acquire their subjectivity. Here, in order to avoid uh, misunderstanding, because there have been so many misunderstandings about that uh, term of discourse that we use in hegemony social strategy, let me stress that by discursive, we are not referring to practice concerned exclusively with speech or writing, but signifying practices in, in which signification and action, so the, the discursive and, 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 and the, the action, cannot be separated. In this view, allegiance to, in the, in the view of, of uh, uh, Wittgenstein, Allegiance to democracy is not something based on rationality, but in participation in specific form of life, in specific affection, as uh, uh, Spinoza will say. As Richard Rorty is often pointed out, a Wittgensteinian perspective makes us realize that allegiance to democracy and the belief in the values of its institution does not depend on giving them an intellectual foundation. There he had an ongoing discussion with uh, Abermas, who said, no, no, we need to you know, give a philosophical foundation. We need to find an argument so that people know that you know, uh, de democracy will be the, 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 the our form, of course, the way in which rational people you know, will necessarily act and, and Wittgenstein uh, and uh, us, uh, Rort indicated, I totally agree with them, this is not what, what is important, you know. In fact, uh, uh, allegiance to 
democratic values is a question of identification and is created not through rational argumentation, but through an ensemble of language game practices which construct democratic form of individuality. And it is very important, Wittgenstein clearly acknowledged the affective dimension of this allegiance that he likens to what he called a passionate commitment to a system of reference. So there is something of passion in this you know, in the identification. So I propose to bring together Spinoza, Wittgenstein, and Freud, uh, uh, and to see inscription in discursive affective practice as providing the affection, which for Spinoza bring about the affect that will spur desire and lead to specific action. So here, you know, the, the question of, you are inscribed in some affection from practices, okay, discursive affective. That is going to produce some affects. The affects are going to produce desire, and desire leads you to act. You know, so you see the, the, the link and why this is important to envisage you know, how, how people act politically. Uh, so by uh, uh, seeing you know, the way in which affects can spur desire and lead to specific action, we can in that way recognize that affects and desire played a crucial role uh, in the constitution of collective identities and that they are the moving force of political action. I submit that this recognition of the crucial role of affects and of the way they can be mobilized is decisive for envisaging democratic politics. Such a theoretical perspective is particularly useful, it seems to me, to comprehend the nature of the populist moment that we are currently witnessing and to envisage how to face the challenge that it represents. Unfortunately, Generally, left parties do not understand the importance of mobilizing affect in a democratic direction. They believe that it is something that is specific to the right and that they should limit themselves to rational argument and deliberative procedure. And this is, in my view, why they are not able to effectively answer the challenge posed by the rise of right-wing populist movement whose success is linked to the fact that they understand much better than the left that politics is always partisan, that it requires the creation of an us-them relation, but of course an us-them you know, in an agonistic form, you know, not seeing the, uh, the them as an enemy to be destroyed, but as an adversary. One crucial for shortcoming of liberal democratic theories, the theories that m m most uh, 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 you know, left parties uh, uh, I, I'm, I'm finishing. Uh, are, uh, are, are, are following is their incapacity to acknowledge the partisan character of politics and the crucial role that affects plays in politics. This incapacity is the consequence, of course, of the theoretical level of their picture of the individual presented as acting in the field of politics as moved either by the pursuit of of interest or by moral concern. This precludes them from recognizing the collective nature of political actors and asking one of the key questions for politics. How are collective form of identification created and what is the part played by affective dimension in this process? By drawing political frontier, and this is my last paragraph, the populist moment that we are witnessing in Europe points certainly to what we can call a return of the political after years of post-politics. A return that may open the way for authoritarian solution through regime that weaken liberal democratic institution. That's for sure. That's a danger. But it can also lead to a reaffirmation and deepening of democratic values. Everything will depend on the kind of populism that emerged victorious from the struggle against post-politic and post-democracy. And it is imperative that progressive sectors understand the importance of involving themselves in that struggle. 
The thought that I would like to leave with you is that to successfully engage in that decisive struggle, it is necessary to have an adequate understanding of the role of affects in politics. Because Spinoza was keen to stress, an affect can only be displayed by an opposed affect that is going to be stronger than the one to be repressed. Many thanks.